Timothy was hardly the most imaginative of playground names, I always found. Um, but I was reminded that um, we had wooden desks at my secondary school still, and with your bio, you would painfully or, you know, diligently inscribe boo thee into it during your English lesson. Uh, and it's only later you reflect of the good sense or not of putting your own name on school property. Um, but it is, you will all be familiar with this kind of impulse to leave your name somewhere you may not be. Perhaps you're all good at standing citizens, I don't know, but you'll be familiar with the many people who have done this. Uh, you'll, you'll know your ancient monuments, your churches, or your quarry faces, or your rock outcrops, or whatever they are, and they have someone's initials in there, or perhaps a full name, and it'll, you know, KB1702, and perhaps they'll put a place name attached to it. So not only do they want to say, this is who I am, but they're also quite proud and loyal to the place that they've come from. You get, um, you get a lot of motifs and symbols. You get, uh, are they called hexafoils, the little sort of witch markings? Um, I was talking with Amal, you get uh, on the lead of church roofs particularly, you get hands and you get feet outlined. Um, you get a lot of images. Ships seem to be a global phenomenon, always ships. In the, in the, in the, in the gatehouse passage of Thornton Abbey in North Lincolnshire, these wonderful masted galleons, a sort of, probably not galleons, sailing ships, uh, mm -hmm. sailing down the passageway, passageway side, and in, indeed at Thornton in the spiral staircase. There's a wonderful little uh, scratch drawing of a post mill, a windmill post mill. And you can sit yourself on the step of the spiral staircase and look out of the window that is there and look across the sort of flatlands of, the, of, of North Lincolnshire. And you can just put your hand up as if you're drawing exactly what you're seeing through that window. It's a lovely, lovely inscription. Um, local societies, local groups have been documenting their graffiti for decades. Um, They've been, you know, categorizing and they've been tracing names and they've been making comparisons with, with the local archive. And they've been, I think as Gail sort of so eloquently was talking about yesterday, they've been looking for those human stories behind those little trace markings. Uh, it seems that, um, it seems that academia has caught up with this because there's been a rash of conferences and, 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 and is it symposii? Who knows, symposiums. Um, over the last 18 months or so, looking at different aspects of graffiti, looking at uh, potential national standards for recording, and all the local groups go, for God's sake, no. Um, looking at uh, preservation, looking at means of recording this stuff, looking at uh, the kind of meaning behind uh, the making of graffiti. Um, I've been to a number of those conferences. I've presented a paper at a couple of them. Um, and there's now, following on from some of the work we've been doing in English Heritage, there's a, a co-collab PhD just starting uh, from York University, looking at graffiti, looking at all those questions of, of meaning and making, and, and making a comparison with uh, modern-day graffiti arts, artists and trying to bring their mentality into the historic record. All very interesting, but none of them, in, in none of that I've been to, or any of the discussions or any of the reading, are collections mentioned. It's all about built fabric. It's all about what's out there in the built environment, the physical graffiti, thank you, Led Zeppelin, um, rather, than, um, rather than bringing in the kind of other side of the record. Now, um, my attachment to graffiti, well, it's long-standing, but particularly recently, um, 2,300 pencil drawn and scratched graffiti in the military cell block at Richmond Castle. Uh, starting in around 1870 and carrying on for 100 years. It is uh, just a phenomenal archive. Uh, I couldn't actually remember which sides I put up, so that's one of them, is it? Good. You've got to have a little picture of Adolf in there, haven't you, if, if possible. Um, you know, this is a, this is a fantastic thing. It, it's a part of a, a much bigger battle scene. That section's about this big on the wall, okay? And the battle scene's about this big. And it has, it goes from sort of a, a Boer War period coastline through to uh, a dogfight of, of, of biplanes, through to, you know, the British chasing the German bombers. This bomb actually does seem to head for a ship and there's a little life raft uh, that's come up from the sunken shift, uh, ship in it. Uh, and, it, and, it and it finishes with um, a kind of Cold War period early jet plane and what's either a V2 rocket or, 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 or a space rocket. It's an amazing construction. Um, yeah, that's, that's a sort of composite of one piece of wall. 
It really has a spike in the First World War with absolutist conscientious objectors who are imprisoned uh, or they're detained on bread and water for 48 hours because they refuse to do anything at all to do with the war. And they put on the war, they put hymns, they put uh, religious tract, they put crucifixes, they put, you know, their statement, their testimony of what their position at that time. They're recording almost in a sort of mirror for themselves who they are, they're self-referencing, they're reinforcing their, their, the strength of what they're doing in there. There's then a second spike in the, in the, in the Second World War, 1939-40, where the local regiment, the Green Howards, I suspect are just getting access to this building for a crafty fag and a game of darts. Uh, there's some lovely darts board scores on the wall as well. Um, and just create an absolute riot of material. Uh, I think we've got, uh, for a making junk and disorderly, someone was put it in the cells there. You get this wonderful, beautiful little inscription, a sort of 1920s portrait, which gradually morphs by Chinese whispers. Uh, well, I don't know whether it gets as far as that, but still, um, through you know, various different attempts. So it's a fantastic social history archive. It is also an archaeological archive because it is a layered record. It's a record that works spatially. You see how um, <clears throat> the development of graffiti by the conscientious objectors seems to often reflect the framing of the shelves, which were gone by then, but they're almost making a little sort of framework. They took themselves away in the corner, just as a sort of little bit of security, perhaps, in the corner of that. You see where some conscientious are starting to echo each other's statements, and you're getting a building text. You see in the Second World War where... Um, soldiers are putting their name close by a particular religious or political statement and a point of association, perhaps. It's a really interesting layered stratigraphic record, um, which you can sort of add to by doing a bit of buildings recording and starting to try and phase the building and then phase the graffiti by according to that as well, as well as according to this kind of research work that you've done around the individuals recorded. And we've actually uh, documented the graffiti on our object database. It, it was a practicality as much as anything, but it's quite interesting to take these individual records, these individual works of art sometimes, and put them in your object database as if they're objects and talk about them and, and work with them in that way. But going back to the point, I mean, this is still wall-based stuff. The idea that in our collections we probably have huge resources of graffitied, struck, inscribed. I, mean, I don't know whether it's a mason mark graffiti or inscription. I don't know, I'll argue, but not now. Um, but you, we've, got, we've got huge amounts of inscribed material, which is not informing this apparent new theme amongst academia of the studying graffiti. So simply on the train down, mulling over a couple of things. Uh, this is a piece of stone from um, uh, Rivo Abbey. Uh, and it's from the uh, rear daughter. It's, it's tumbled in as the rear daughter has gradually collapsed. Um, and as Susan has just pointed out to me, it was probably created in more than one sitting. Thank you. Um, uh, you know, some sort of bird with other scratchings around it. Um, and that's a piece of ex situ architecture. So in our collections, we have ex situ material which directly correspond and parallel with the in situ stuff that people are recording. So that needs to be in some way brought into the discussion. Um, just doing a trawl of our database, you don't really use the word graffiti quite often in your own description. So you're not finding the piece we've just looked at. Susan said it used to be, you know, it was an inscribed image, which is absolutely fine as a description, but if you try to search to graffiti, you ain't gonna find it. So we don't actually know what graffiti we might actually have in our collection because of the way that it's been recorded previously. This piece, um, uh, very, apparently a very recent find, uh, turning over a stone from Gloucester Blackfriars, um, interpret it as you will. It looks sort of like a Henrician redoubted fort, but it's probably got all sorts of other symbols as well. Um, again, I don't know the history of this stone, but I suspect that again is ex situ. You often get sort of uh, things like windowsills where Merrill's boards have been carved into that we have in the, have in the collection. But then going beyond that ex situ stuff, you go into the actual, actual collection. Who's been playing? Anyway. Um, uh, Nico the Slave, uh, apparently. Now, well, probably, if, certainly when I 
sent out to my team examples of graffiti, I said, not Roman, please, because that was the obvious thing that was going to come back. And I don't actually know whether that this is, whether there are far more Roman inscriptions in our collection because the Romans had a predilection for writing on things, or whether it's the kind of epigraphic tradition of Roman studies that has meant this has come to the fore and actually buried in our collections, there's a much deeper post-Roman record that we just haven't picked up on. Um, but also, if you think about Nico the slave, you're thinking about someone potentially writing, well, is the slave writing a name, is same in their possession, all sorts of questions. But there's lots of examples of pot where people seem to be writing their name on it to say, this is my pot, get off. How different is that sort of inscription on a collection item than the writing of a name on a wall, which might be more about recording presence rather than ownership? I'm really, you know, this talk is so short, it's not about thinking through the whys and wherefores of graffiti. It's just really asking whether or not uh, museum collections perhaps have an additional contribution that can be made, stop it, um, to, to this wider theme of graffiti that uh, it seems to be current within academia. And in what ways might the graffiti on collections lend a distinctive and different voice to the kind of narratives that are coming out of built heritage graffiti. That's that, thank you. <laughs>